Josh, my guy, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. And um, I usually get a build up. So I try to figure out, um, you know, the best format and usually working with each and every guest that I have, I usually try to dig into their, you know, beginnings. And then we expand across, you know, the board so we can really dig in on what you did from the start and, you know, your ventures to where you're at today. So can you give the audience a little background of who you are, who Josh is and what you're doing today? For sure. Yeah. So my name is Josh Janis. I am 22. Um, I'm a real estate agent and investor based out of Cleveland and Columbus, Ohio. Um, I started out kind of a college student uh, studying computer science, driving for DoorDash, trying to figure out what I was going to do. I was studying that, but I didn't really know. I wasn't that passionate about it, and I knew I'd have a higher income as a result. So I wanted to utilize um, a good chunk of my income to create cash flow somehow, whether it was a business or something. And I kind of came across real estate um, early on, and that led me to where I am today. Nice, man. So uh, humble beginnings, right? And then um, as you, you know, worked as an agent investor, what is what's your active agent side look like as as you're doing deals and stuff like that? Um, do you have a team behind you? Are you solo agent? How's that work? Yeah, right now I'm a solo agent. I do have virtual assistants that manage the majority of the transaction, but I'm still the one talking to clients, sending them deals, et cetera. Gotcha. Okay. And um, how have you been able to process and put these systems into place for those VAs? Because I think a lot of people, especially these days, are utilizing VAs um, on doing better and more effective work. How have you been able to systematize that? Yeah. So I basically kept a notepad next to me. And whenever I would do something unique, I would write it down. And at the end of the day, it'd be like a hundred things, right? And when you're an agent, you do so many little things and a lot of the things you actually repeat. So I would review at the end of each day and figure out what, what am I doing multiple times throughout the day that I could condense into doing once, right? But then most importantly, what can I write a procedure for and delegate? And over time, I continuously filled my day with higher paying tasks. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's perfect. So you're able to water down the stuff that ultimately you can, you know, piece out to someone $10 an hour, $15 an hour, $20 an hour. Yeah. Um, and how would you source and also vet these VAs? Because my experience and a lot of other people that what I speak to is, you know, A's can be, um, you know, challenging to have a, a decent VA, honestly. Um, so how were you able to do that? That you were able to do yeah. and how successful were you on that? Um, I started, so first off the brokers that I worked at Reefco real estate, um, mm -hmm. we had like a management company we were partnering with for the VAs for our brokerage. And the person was kind of embezzling some money running it. So we actually just bought everybody out of their okay. contracts. But that's not exactly repeatable for people. What is, is I went to Upwork.com and I vetted a good chunk of people there. Um, a lot of other agents and investors around me do the same thing. I would suggest, you know, asking about their background, their experience, their skill level in English, their uh, ability to be creative, their ability to write their own procedures. I think a lot of those things are helpful skill sets when looking at VAs and, you know, if you got to pay them a little bit more, it's probably worth it. Yeah. I mean, I've done with VAs and stuff like that. I I've, I've run VAs where, um, I've ran them for a couple of months and then all of a sudden either their productivity level goes down because they're doing, you know, they start doing their systems and then they put it into place and then maybe put someone else into place and it's not really their, you know, effectiveness that, that, that I hired them for. And then all of a sudden it's a, a lack of systems and or hard work that's, that's going into it. So how have you combated that? Yeah. I mean, I, I work, I work in a one through five process by doing things in order and I train them and built their procedures. So they do the same thing. And then at the end of each day, I'm able to kind of see what they're accomplishing. Um, I'm always wanting them to figure out ways they can be more productive, you know, and yeah. Another thing I think is important is I meet with them at least once a quarter to figure out like, hey, the goal here is for you to work at a pace that you can do for the next 20 years for me while we grow together. 
well, what does that look like for you? And I'm always adjusting their schedule a little bit and making sure that, you know, there are people too. They're not just like robots. Um, yeah. 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 I agree. I mean, it's, you got to, you know, develop and build a relationship with, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a VA that's in the Philippines or, you know, someone that's right in your office, you got to be able to build a culture upon, you know, what you're doing and what your vision is for the, you know, next 15, 20 years, like you said, um, how have you been able to, outside of the processes and, you know, the things that you've been able to sit after a full day's work and water down the stuff that you can, you know, hand off to someone doing 10 or $15 an hour tasks, how have, have you been able to be successful, um, in your position, uh, after, you know, starting out so small and then build up? Yeah. I think in the beginning I was engaging a lot with potential buyers and sellers that were three to six or 12 months away from doing something. And I wanted them to be the agent that they remembered. So I follow, I followed up with them a really good amount. And I was always trying to be their friend. I asked, answered a lot of questions and most agents aren't willing to do that because they don't really make you money for a while. And yeah. then eventually all of those chips started to fall and they all started to do things, which helped me scale really quickly. Yeah. I mean, so in the beginning, um, were you still doing, did you say DoorDash? What were you doing? Yeah, I was doing DoorDash and okay. studying and then I started cold calling. And then okay. once my cold calling started to make me enough money to where it was better than DoorDash and I did that. And okay. then when doing full-time cold calling started to do better than what school would have made me, I dropped school. Okay. Got it. And were you my question ultimately is like, how are you able to have the money to transition? So from DoorDash to full-time real estate agent slash investor, how are you able to do that? Was there amount of retained earnings that you kept or did you keep that DoorDash until you met that gap and then flipped over completely? Yeah. I mean, DoorDash, if I just go full-time DoorDash, I can make like five grand a month. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I was waiting until I would was making that doing yeah. cold calling. And then as soon as I started to make five grand a month cold calling, I started to do that full time. And then I was thinking that my software income cap was probably like 15 to 20 K a month. And then I started to hit that cold calling and then I dropped school and maintained being a full-time agent and then eventually started to invest. Okay. Um, and cold calling, who are you guys? Are you calling yourself or is it VAs? I'm calling myself. I was pulling list of duplexes in the area that I rent in now still. And okay. I was just calling everybody because I wanted to try to find a house hack. And yeah. uh, that's how I started finding some leads. Okay. And then do you still call same type of list today or is that completely different? You scrap that and do something different. I have VAs call the list first to vet out to see like the actual owner's phone numbers because that's the first barrier. Then once it's like a cleaner list, then I have agents that are kind of underneath me that I will help um, train them mm -hmm. by call, calling those lists. And then when they find potential leads, either buyers or sellers, I get their information that I go in there at the, at the end. Gotcha. Okay. And what have you seen the most success with, uh, you know, cold calling? Obviously, you've been successful with it, but what's the specific avatar that you're looking for? I mean, someone that knows their property and they're willing to give you the information, but they don't really give it too quick because you give it too quick. There's a category of sellers that like talking about what they own and they'll just do that all day. Yeah. But if you try to put something on paper, they're never going to take any action. Yes. So that is one way that I vetted sellers. And if I was calling people and turning them into buyers, I have an off market agreement that I require everybody to sign that roughly okay. states you use me as your agent. If I bring you a deal. And that's an amazing way to, to factor out somebody that is potentially serious or not at all. If they're not willing to sign it, don't waste another minute with them. Move on. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. Um, cause there's a lot of people that are kicking tires and, um, and I think for you, you know, early on, it sounds like you were able to weave, you know, weed through a lot of these scripts to get to the base of being able to transact fairly quickly. Um, what does that look like? What is a, what does script look like for you? Um, what's that conversation flow and how are you able to convert so many? 
Yeah. So I was calling in eight class areas in Columbus, which is a very competitive market. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't just saying, Hey, you want to, can I, can I bring an offer? You want to sell? They're just going to hang up their phone immediately. Yeah. Regardless. They literally get called 20 times a day. So the yeah. way that I try to separate myself is one, I'm an American that speaks English and I'm actually from there. So that's a big advantage. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, I would just ask them, Hey, I see you own this. You also own another four unit. Like I'm a young investor trying to get into real estate. I'm just trying to learn. I'm not here to harass you about your property. You know, like here's a deal. I found a couple of streets down. Maybe his price is too high. Would you be interested in that? You know, I just try to have like open-ended conversations and you know, those investors that didn't have a lot of guidance when they started, when they see somebody young, that's willing to put in the work and it's consistent and it's calling you every couple of weeks. They're usually willing to help in my experience. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they see, you know, you coming up, you know, in your position being younger, if you're a go getter, a lot of those people end up, you know, lending a helping, a helping hand, even if they're not willing to sell, they maybe have someone that they can refer you to. That's going to, you know, look to sell that you can help out. Um, and right now, getting deals how are you funding the deals that you have in the past and then now yeah so the majority of the deals that i'm doing are burrs so okay. uh just basic value add deals the majority of them i'm financing them through hard money okay. um and then i'm starting to leverage private money i use private money as well for down payments on hard money so i was very leveraged but yeah. i was able to do a couple done like six deals i think with no money out of pocket utilizing okay. both sources yeah. Um, but making sure, right. Like after you do your first deal, document it in a, in a, as long as it was a good deal, document it. And then you can present it to people that maybe want to get into real estate, but they don't necessarily want to buy their own deal. It's like, Hey, I'm going to buy this deal. You want to fund it for 11% return. I'll be done in three to six months. Yeah. Um, that seemed to work so far. And how are you pitching the, how are you finding these investors that, you know, private money? Cause that's one thing that's, you know, that holds a lot of people back is being able to, to get access to private money versus always using hard money or always your own money. Yeah. I mean, I'm by no means a private money expert at this point. So I'm still early on. I can probably give you a better answer in a year or two, but, uh, I think you can start pitching it to people that have businesses with large revenues because they can easily take out lines of credit with their bank and just lend mm -hmm. you that money. And then, you know, it's not the cheapest money, maybe seven, eight percent, but then they can lend it to you for 13 percent or something. Mm -hmm. um, and you can build a relationship from there. Also, being an agent um, and an agent that's reasonably well known, there's a lot of people that reach out. Uh, you can cold call and reach out to people, the people that want to get into real estate and have money, but they don't want to like buy their own properties and manage it. And maybe they're a little risk averse. That's the ideal person that would be willing to lend private money in my experience. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so how risk tolerance, obviously your, your risk tolerance is pretty high because you did hard money and then private money on top of that to get the down payment. Um, how did that go? You know, just on the couple of deals that you did, it sounded like, um, if I'm, you know, not mistaken, I think you said a couple of them that you did. <laughs> you going through that? I mean, when was that? Was that a couple years ago, or was that within the last six months? And how were you able to, you know, hold it together? Because some people are, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do twenty percent, you know, twenty eighty, and I'm going to do a hard money loan. I feel comfortable with that. Um, that's still somewhat dicey for some people, but how are you able to do basically a hundred percent, if you will? Yeah, I bought my first deal around 11 months ago. Um, okay. That one was just classic hard money, put like 15% down. But I think if you're finding deals with enough margin, right, between your purchase price, your rehab, plus reserves, and then you are got to make sure your ARV conservatively has a good spread outside there, at least like 20% or 30% mm -hmm. higher. Um, you know, if you're confident in those numbers and you oversee your – your deals and you manage your contractors reasonably well. I think it's a, it's a system that works really in any market and it's pretty repeatable. I've done it. I'm getting close to like 30 times now since then. Have you ran into issues now with Fannie Freddie changing it to 12 months on cash out, um, or, you know, refi versus, you know, what, it, what it was six, 
six months ago, I think it was back in March, they changed it or April that it changed. Have you had any issues with that? Um, not at this point. I'm still not even lendable via conventional. I don't have two years of the same income. Okay. So I just use commercial DSCR, non-QM, okay. non-conforming debt to refinance into with short or no seasoning periods. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Yeah, that that knocks out a lot of stuff. Talk about uh, DSCR uh, if some people that are listening don't aren't familiar with it. So talk to me about that and that lending tool. Yeah, debt service coverage ratio loan. They don't really care if you make money as an individual in your job. They care about, in my experience, your credit score and the performance of the property. You have to make sure that the income the property produces covers the debt service, usually at like 1.25% ratio, so 25% higher than your mortgage payment, okay. um, including all PITI. But it's pretty cool. You can get literally unlimited DSCR loans. There's no cap like conventional with 10. Uh, yeah, that's huge. Yeah, I mean, they're they're very beneficial because like you said, there's a lot of people that are capped out at, you know, the max of, of 10 loans. And then they try to think about what's the next move and they want to stay in single family. And, you know, that's that's a gap to bridge um, that's been, you know, very helpful for a lot of people. So when you're, you know, let's look, you've done a lot, you know, in the last 12, 12 months. What are you looking at in the next 12 to 18 months as business grows, as you get better on, on systems and also sales? What do you, what do you see for your future? Yeah. Uh, I would like to scale to like 50 plus contracts at the same time. So I'm trying to, um, I'm building like a website to put my off market deals on. I'm trying to rely on different agents instead of me communicating with everybody, maybe building a team. So that's kind of what's happening on the agent side. And then on the investor side, really my goal is to just keep scaling, try to build some more contracting crews so that I can manage, so that I can like renovate 20 units at the same time. That's kind of my next milestone okay. and figure out how to do that. Okay. Are you wholesaling any of these contracts? So I do like hybrid wholesaling okay. in a way. So when I cold call a seller, let's say he wants 400K for his four unit, I will just write up an email that has the purchase price of 400,000 mm -hmm. with 6% on top of it. And then I'll send that out to my investors. And if somebody makes an offer, I just write 6% commission in there. Be like, okay. Hey, here's an investor. He's experienced. And I present it. Got it. Got it. And have you been successful on a lot of those or is that something new that you've put into the fold? Uh, Remington Lyman, the owner of the broker jump at started that concept. And I've been, that's the bread and butter. That's the bread and butter. Okay. And so agent wise, what does it look like for transactions over the course of the last 12 months? Uh, 150 plus. And you're, you're still able to do that with how many VAs? I have two. Okay. Two VAs. All right. And any TCs involved too, or are they doing the TC work as well? They're doing that as well. Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. And for you doing, you know, 50 contracts a month, what, what about the investing side? Talk to me about, you know, doing the burst strategy. If you get to 50 contracts a month, you'll probably be in the, in the ballpark of being able to buy stuff, even more cash or 20% down. Is that a direction that you would go at that point? So you take 50 contracts, you're moving down the road and you're, uh, you know, a month, are you going to change course or are you going to continue to do burrs? Uh, basically I'm marketing to find value at deals and I'm either going to a burr it or B, uh, make it turnkey and then market that out to my clients as turnkey properties, which are people, a lot of people are interested in. Yeah. So that's like two extra strategies, right? The second one has a lot of capital gains tax involved with it because it's short term. So then my next funnel around that is to buy bigger commercial deals, whether it's large multifamily or sets of commercial to use cost segs to kind of lower those capital gains taxes so I don't get killed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you done um, cost segs on your properties now? I've done DIY cost segregations. It's a website because yeah. I haven't bought any big deals yet. So those make sense for things under 300K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and have they helped you out with taxes? What, what type of, um, you know, 
tax implications have they helped you out with? Because as you look at it, you get short-term rental, which is, you know, bonus appreciation. And those are, those are really good for cost sags, but for your properties, how many properties do you have now? Like somewhere around like 30 units. Okay. And have those helped out tremendously? I mean, my purchase prices right now are still tiny. So I did like 320 K cost segs each. So that equates to, I don't know, like 20,000 in tax write-offs, yeah, nothing, yeah. nothing crazy, but you know, over time start buying bigger stuff. Yeah. And when is the plan to start buying bigger stuff or do you plan a 1031 it into bigger stuff or are you going to keep the stuff that you have now? And then at some point down five, 10 years, you're going to 1031 that. Uh, I'm doing a 1031 right now with a flip, but yeah, that's kind of the plan is to defer those taxes. Yeah. 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 And, and so do you have, since you've scaled pretty quickly and, um, I think, uh, you know, you're super smart and what you've done, do you have a mentor you've been following? For sure. Yeah. Remington that I mentioned earlier, he's yeah. the, the owner of the brokerage I'm at. Um, he helps me a ton on the Asian side and on the investment side. He's got a lot of units. And then on another investor, his name's Alex. He lives in Columbus. I cold called him on a single family. He bought one of the first deals he bought like over 10 years ago okay. and uh, met with him. Nice. Nice. And how would you say that that mentorship has put you on a different playing field? What, and, and what type of things, what type of key pieces of information have they given you to be able to set you up for the next level? So very crucial. I mean, even if your mentor is two steps ahead of you, I would still try to find somebody, you know, like they can like pave the road in front of you if you're going down something that you don't really know where you're going um, in general, but then specifics, right? Like taxes, setting up like business entities, S corps, and then how to, that's like on the investment side and then learning how to network with sellers a little bit. And on the agent side, you know, leveraging VAs, procedures, how to manage your time so you're not like wasting too much time with people that aren't serious, things like that. What's your day look like? So if we uh, if we got to the office at the same time as you, um, when do you start work and when do you finish up? And then including all that, what are you doing throughout the day? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of in my work stage right now, so I'm getting there at like 6.15 and just in the, in the morning responding to a lot of the things that i missed starting at 8 p.m the night before mm -hmm. and then uh keeping up with it's kind of like my transaction time so keeping up with everything that's going on make sure everybody's on the same page going through inspection reports etc and then throughout my day after that i start working with buyers that aren't in contract yet sending them deals answering their questions mm -hmm. uh, and then after that's usually like client calls uh, with new investors, seeing if it makes sense for me to work with them and vice versa. And the day usually wraps up around six. I hit a workout and come home and review for an hour. Okay. And time management, you talked about that a minute ago before I asked you the last question. For time management, how do you keep track of your time? And what? how does your day look? I know you just went through the day, but is it, you know, two hours in the morning that you're, um, reviewing inspections and stuff like that. And then, you know, three hours in the afternoon on, on client follow-up, how does that look? So people can get an idea of what your level is. Yeah. I don't time, like I don't time block specifically for those things, but I do schedule every hour of my day. Some of them are just broader. Like, uh, if a good thing to do as an agent is, if you're bringing in new investors, have a Calendly set up and have okay. them schedule 15 minute calls. And mm -hmm. that's a good way that I've been able to organize at least that end, which can be a little chaotic. Okay. What are, when you're talking to sellers, what are some big objections that you have, um, that you typically overcome and you got to the point where you're efficient. So when they come up, it's like, yeah, man, I got that. Yeah. Some of them, right. The classic, I don't want to pay the taxes. So I'd try to give them some resources on a 1031 or on different forms of owner financing. Mm -hmm. That's a big one in Ohio where things have kind of jumped recently. Mm -hmm. um, another one, they're scared. Like sometimes they don't want to work with realtors or they're afraid of like not getting enough for their property. So like I usually just send them like sales comparables. Um, yeah. 
you know, I talk about the fact that I invest in there. I'll tell them properties that I own or properties that I've helped sell, try to build up my, um, credibility with them. Mm -hmm. Those are some tactics, but usually, right? Like over time when you're cold calling and you start closing some off market deals, you'll see some indicators of whether someone's motivated or not. So like a couple of things would be years of ownership, price paid. Do they pay market price or did they pay a lot less a long time ago and they're sitting on equity? Is it in an LLC with 400 other properties that they built up a portfolio? They don't really want to sell because they're making money. Is it in their name? Is it like those are a bunch of indicators that could show motivation. Yeah. 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 Um, and do you have, so did you work out scripts on your own or did you have, you know, scripts that you pulled offline or, or from a coach and then applied those and, you know, put those into, you know, some type of script that you were able to convert better than what you got off the internet? Um, I honestly listened to Brandon Mulrennan, um, on YouTube for okay. a good two, three months every night. That guy's great at cold calling. And I kind of built some scripts based on the free resources that he had. Okay. So YouTube is where you got the success. Um, I guess. <laughs> I feel like so many people go into scripts and and they end up reading it for, you know, verbatim. And then they get, you know, thrown for, through a loop when Josh asks me a completely different question that's not on the script or not what I was prepared for. And then they go down a, you know, a spiral. How are you able to, you know, circumvent that, especially, you know, now and then training other people? Yeah, I, I don't, I'm probably not the most like pressure oriented cool caller out there. I try to just match the energy and the wavelength that the person on the other on the other end of the phone has. If they're talking quick and they're stressful, like I'll match it. If they're just hanging on their couch, like, you know, I'm not going to ask like, what's the age of the roof? The Like, I'm not going to ask them like 10 questions at once. I'll just kind of have general conversations with them. Um, yeah. Yeah. So almost mirroring the person. So as they're, you know, Tony Robbins is big on mirroring and, and when you hear a person or see a person, which way they're standing or, or the conversations you end up seeing, you know, where that conver conversation is going to lead. And you can really talk to, and feel out the person, you know, if they're older and they've had a, you know, traumatic situation the past 12 months to 24 months of, you know, their spouse dying or something, you can really gather that information and not ask them 15 questions as a, you know, a shotgun, you know, right out the gate. Like you said, Josh, you, you're able to walk them through certain things, right? Yeah. I think it's one strategy that I utilized that was pretty good is I would call new people like the coldest, coldest calls in the morning. Uh -huh. And then if I had any level of connection with them, I would be like, all right, I'll call you later. And people say that all the time and they don't, but I'll actually, I would hit them back up five hours later at 2 PM. And they, they, that's when they start to remember you and then you separate yourself. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Cause usually people are like, I'll follow up with you in two weeks or I'll follow you up with it, you know, tomorrow. And then they never do. Um, what type of CRM are you using to make sure that you're, you know, in line on following up with them? Speaking of follow-ups. Yeah. Follow-up boss. I think any of them work if you're utilizing it to its ability. Yeah. 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 Follow-up boss is really good. We use that too yeah, for that's my sweet. team. It's, it's helpful because, you know, there's so many times that, you know, you see an agent or you talk to someone and they're like, just writing it down on, you know, on a notepad or they're writing it down on, you know, the, uh, the notes on your phone and that gets lost because you can write, you know, 15 notes in one day and then not remember exactly what goes with what. Um, so writing those notes because you can really come back to someone in two months and know exactly what you said to them two months ago. Yep. And it freaks them out. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. And you're like, uh, <laughs> no, I remember that you had a kid and you're, you know, working, working through that process of, you know, the first year of having the kid. Um, and outside of the CRM, are there some other things that you guys use to be efficient for your VA systems? I just write procedures on Google docs and Google sheets. Okay. And review them every once in a while and tighten them up. But for the most part, that's where most of it is. Okay. How long did it take you to, to get those VAs up to, you know, I guess we would say your standards and saying like, Hey, we, you know, I can let the, the, the reins off. 
Yeah, that took a while, and it takes – that was a, a set of courage I did not have right away. I didn't believe that they could do certain things, and then I'd give them a little bit of the rope, and they would execute, and I'd give them a little bit more, and then all of a sudden your trust grows with them. But in the beginning, it's a lot of – it's a ton of work on the front end, like pr producing those, but it's going to save you hours and hours after. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely save you hours after just doing that upfront work. And then, like you said, every couple months or every month, you know, get five hours, six hours and really tighten up your processes. And, and if there is something new that came out, um, that you can implement, just make sure you, you make that quick change. Um, is there a lot of, when you, you know, go through the training process with VAs, is there a lot of training throughout the months? So let's say you train them, you know, January, 2023, are you following up with them um, outside of like team meetings and stuff like that? Are you following up with them monthly and saying like, hey, we got to go back over these policies and procedures? I mean, I'll just point out when they make mistakes and kind of okay. show them what the right thing is to do. Um, I, I, w I started to pay them more and I kind of even got better quality because they were more motivated. So I think that helps. A lot of people yeah. are like, they want to get really good work for $3 an hour. And it's like, that's the bare minimum over there. Yeah. Yeah. It's bare minimum. And, and usually now that you see, I mean, it, it used to be when I first started using Upwork, it was like, you know, three to like $8 and then, you know, you get stuff for 10, but now it's like, you know, 10 is like the minimum. Um, and you go from there depending on, you know, what type of, uh, VA that you're looking for with VAs that you've gotten success wise, how many did you have to go through to you actually said, okay, well now I have, you know, good ones in a place. Was it a couple or was it like 20? It was between 10 and 20. Okay. And how quickly did you fire, fire these people um, to say like, Hey, you're not a right fit. I'm not a right fit for you. You know, we got to move on. I got to find somebody else. Was it a couple months? Uh, some of them took a little bit longer. Some of them were pretty quick. I basically, if they just made the same mistake multiple times in a short time frame, when acknowledging that they would fix it, I just move, would move on. Okay. And have you thought about since you're efficient at hiring them, the more that you hire, just putting someone in a place as a, as like a hiring manager to be able to hire these VAs as the more you need them, obviously you're, you're pretty efficient with two, but has that been something that you've looked towards? Yeah. The, one of the ones that I use, she's kind of like the quote unquote mother VA of everybody. So okay. she can like help hire other ones. I think, I think like if you only need one hire two or hire one immediately train them and then have them train the next one. Okay. Cause then you can start delegating the training process. Yeah. 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 Um, and so they have a lot of headhunters. Um, did you go through and that's, that's what I've dealt with too, with VAs. Um, sounds like this lady, that's like the mother of, uh, the VAs that you got going on. Um, but is, is this kind of the same thing? Like she's a headhunter and in, in like the VA space in that, you know, in that area, because I had one that I spoke to and that's what she did. She found them. She kind of runs them. She's the manager. Is that the same thing? Or did you appoint someone like, Hey, you've done good. You know, or can you watch these two? She was kind of like the head one in the company that our brokerage was using the person above her. Her name was Michelle. She was the real head hunter. But okay. she was, we would increase the pay and she would keep whatever it was. Yeah. Um, it was not great. Gotcha. Gotcha. So she would, you would increase it from 10 to 20. She would keep the 10 and keep paying them um, 10. Okay. And any, you know, over the course of, why don't you give me two things that you've learned over the course of the last 12 months that are um, challenges that you had to overcome in any space, you know? doing any type of contracts to sales, to investing, two big ones. Two big ones. Uh, one was I, when I first started to have like 15 to 20 deals in contract at once, I was just completely overwhelmed getting blown up by title and lender and not maintaining anything mm -hmm. that well. Cause I was also, you know, working on my business, investing, trying to get more deals. So my day was just flooded. 
I created like a different email address and a different phone number for my admins. And uh, kind of when somebody goes in contract, it all gets shifted over to there. And that like, that was a huge exhale in terms of the number of things I had to do in a day. It cleared out a lot. Um, yeah. That's one. And another one was I, I was doing a lot of, well, I am, I'm doing a lot of remote renovations and yeah. I didn't really have a very good um, like quality check. So the GC would say they're done and then my property manager would go there and he'd be like, this isn't done. This is yeah. 80% there. Yeah. So I started utilizing somebody else as like a middleman that's unbiased. Check it, make a list. GC gets it done and boom. <laughs> Do you still have that property manager show up or is it just um, to double check that middleman's work? Yeah. Yeah. I always have the PM walk through it completely. Usually they find a couple things after, but it's a lot cleaner now. Yeah. That's, that's good to have that system in a place because, you know, the quality control is hard um, because GCs just want to move on and get another job done. Uh, so having that, that person that's, you know, ultimately a, a placeholder so you know they can look at the quality of work is is huge we've done i've done a project where it was like you know half the room was tilted because they they didn't want to do you know the flooring properly and we had to like an escrow do you know t like five or six thousand dollars worth of work because of it um oh, man which was which was nice um and the contractor didn't want to come back but one that'd be insane one, one more challenge but, yeah. Contractors, in my experience, will tell you they can take on more work than what they can. Yeah. So, like, you be the one saying in your head if they can actually do this project also, or should I wait, or should I find someone else? Yeah, that's right. So I had a, I had this guy. I was like, um, and I had been referred to him as a contractor, and so I. This reminds me. So. I kept calling him. I'm like, dude, this guy's just busy. I, you know, and I was telling my wife, I'm like, the guy's just busy. Let's just not worry about it. The guy's busy. I'll get a hold of him. So I finally get a hold of him. Ultimately, like it was like, you know, probably his 15th job that he had like circling. And it was like, you know, the quality of work was, was crap and everything else. So yeah, man, um, I agree with you on, they'll continue to say that they're good and they're not good. You know, it's like the bottom of the barrel, you know, job and, and they do want the money. The other way to find out about that is, um, if you get a couple of estimates and one of them's like, you know, 40 or 50% higher, you know, expense wise than the other ones, you know, like they're, they're either suck and they don't, they do like one job a year or, they have so many jobs going on. They're like, if you pay this, then I'm good. And I will do it for this. So I like it. <laughs> that's another way too. Um, well, so to finish up, um, you've grown a ton, you've been super successful and you've been able to put systems into place. So, um, I really see that. And I think that that's a huge highlight of this, this episode of, you know, having a conversation with you, Josh, um, and seeing that you're doing things at a high level. What would you say if I was just starting out like you were, and what is one key piece of advice you would give me? Um, I, I'm always harping on this, but cold calling, I think that is one of the the biggest dividers and somebody who can handle the the rigorous ups and downs of real estate as an agent or an investor pull list in an area that you know or that you want to learn call and try to learn don't necessarily just try to get deals right away um i think that you know set up a schedule right i'm gonna do it nine to eleven every morning five mm -hmm. days a week sun up or sun down i'm doing it mm -hmm. and i think that pays off pretty well yeah, setting that time, like, you know, talking about time block and not, you don't have to time block every 30 seconds of the day, but being able to time block at least follow up and cold calling or, you know, whatever your lead gen system is, that is massive. That, that keeps, you know, for one, you sharp and two, that keeps the dollars coming in. That's, that's one thing that a lot of people lose out on because they don't think about following up or putting that into place, you know, throughout the week. Um, okay. And what about a book or a resource that you used over the course of your career so far that's really helped you out? Um, I could say a classic real estate book or rich dad, poor dad, but I'm actually going to say 
uh, Jordan Peterson's 12 rules for life. Okay. Because, you know, if you're trying to scale or you're trying to do something that you don't think you can do, your emotions are going to go everywhere. I think yes. a book like that can really help keep you grounded and prepared and able to kind of keep your decision making consistent and good. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, well, cool, man. Josh, it's been great. Where can people find out more about you, find about, uh, contact you if they want to and get to know you a little bit more? Yeah. Hit me up. Uh, Josh Janus, J-A-N-U-S on Bigger Pockets and on Instagram. Okay, cool, man. Josh, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate your time and I appreciate you coming on and sharing a little bit about you and how you've been able to grow so quickly. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate it. Thanks, man.